Good deal. Okay. Can you hear me? I'm going to step back here for just a minute just to see if this remote works while I move around. Uh, Dave and Sam probably wouldn't believe me, but uh, I was raised to be a Southern Baptist preacher, and then I went to Vietnam for two tours, and I never looked back. So I never got to be the preacher, but I still have a hard time standing behind those podiums. I've got to move around a bit. Uh, fascinating stuff here this morning, but uh, the caveats, and I gave these caveats to Carol's group yesterday, uh, everything you are a professional expert at, I am ignorant of. I'm the token economist here, although somebody did say there's one other economist here, so we kind of share the target that you put on this. He's probably not in the room here with us, is he? Okay, well, all right, well then I'll point to him for stuff. But uh, I've been doing public policy education and uh, work as an economist at Oklahoma State for nearly 30 years. Uh, Sam showed up and we said he was a kid that has potential. Uh, I can't say that anymore. We, we just say he has potential now. Okay, so um, I got a picture here of uh, Terry Bidwell. Any of y'all know Terry in Oklahoma? And uh, there's, there's no question he's more rabid than Sam is about how fire is the way to deal with this and the only good cedar is a dead or burned one and uh, it, it just shouldn't be out there. Uh, we've got people in Oklahoma on the other hand and Oklahoma is largely a, a, a private land state. Some of you come from public lands. I'm a native of New Mexico so I sort of get that uh, but, but our, our case, our focus here is more in states where it's mostly private land and we are continuing to have this argument with folks uh, about whether or not we should be doing anything about cedars because some of them think that they see a value in it. And so we have this problem and we, we've heard about all the technical aspects of this and excellent job with all of that, but from a, from a view of someone who looks at policy on a regular basis, What's really at the heart of this is it's a question about freedom. And some of you go back to uh, uh, studying Tom Paine and people like him at the beginnings of trying to decide if we were going to have a young nation called the United States. Good to see you, sir. One of my uh, uh, administrators from Oklahoma State. Good to have you here. And I got a, a guy down here that reminded me that he used to uh, work with me as a communicator. So I, have a few friends out here, but Tom Paine, you know, gave this great idea about freedom. It says, I have the freedom to move my fist at the end of my arm as far as I can, as much as I want, but when it starts to come into contact with your nose, when it starts to come into contact with your nose, then I have violated your freedom. And that's sort of the great debate about what's going on today in politics. And I know John just briefly talking to him beforehand is going to have a few pointed things perhaps to say about government. And so I'm not going to be a proponent of more government or less government, but that's really sort of what's at the heart of this problem in Oklahoma. Private property rights. And it becomes apparent that Fire is a way to deal with this, but how are we going to do that? Are we going to do it on a voluntary cooperative basis? Are we going to pass laws to that? And if we pass laws, are we going to mandate things? And you've heard people talk about the different ways of resolving uh, this issue of dealing with cedars, uh, junipers. To be honest with you, I'd never heard the term juniper in respect to this. I'd always thought of red eastern red cedars, but uh, we've looked at all of these at various levels and we are beginning to have a foundation of the costs of doing the burn stuff and a little bit of doing the mechanical stuff. Some of the chemical applications are new enough. I don't think we have a very good database there yet. Uh, the goat's an issue. Uh, some people are trying that out. Uh, some people are saying that it's a value-added crop and we ought to 
uh, take care of it piecemeal. We've got uh, a new option in Oklahoma. Have anybody uh, in here heard of Blue Sky Corporation? Uh, they are allied with uh, an international uh, corporation out of Australia and uh, Brazil, and they've got these super uh, mowers that go out and, uh, and just begin to mow this stuff down, and there's a portable chipper pelletizer sitting by the road, and they dump all of this into that and pelletize it right there and bale it, and then they put it on a boat or a train or a truck and get it to the Gulf Allen and then they ship it to Europe and they're using that to fuel their generators to produce energy, to produce electricity over there. Now, we can talk about this later if you have questions. We met with them and didn't quite see how they could make it work, but they've found uh, government subsidies and uh, uh, venture capital from uh, China and uh, they've already uh, begun to sign contracts in Oklahoma, so we, what happens. Uh, this is fuzzy uh, because of my failure being technically adept, but I just snagged and grabbed it off of one of the Forest Service sites just this past week. Uh, but the idea is just to show you where we've had problems with those uh, fires that exceeded expectations, as John called them. I'd never heard that before. Uh, and this isn't all cedar. It's probably mostly cedar right in here. Uh, but uh, just to show that that is a problem in Oklahoma, according to some people, because uh, they don't like to see their homes burnt. And we've had serious wildfires, and I'm a Red Cross volunteer, so I've worked uh, wildfires in Oklahoma the last few years. And attend, I, I can tell you there's people that have a problem with them. Uh, you don't like this, uh, I think, in this room for the most part. Uh, but there are people, there are a contingent of them who say that we can get good things out of cedar and there is an element uh, of those folks, at least in Oklahoma and some of the other states who have cedar issues and they can talk about renewable ener energy or aromatic oils or uh, pesticides or uh, lumber for construction. Uh, they can talk about habitat. Uh, they can talk about windbreaks. That's sort of where it, some people say it got started, uh, back in the Dust Bowl using cedars because they were cheap. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if they would have used bamboo instead of cedar to make those windbreaks. Would we be having the same kind of discussions? Um, but they don't like the idea of compensation unless you're telling them that they've got to compensate their neighbors if they want to keep their cedars. So that issue. Compensation becomes a, a question about whether or not you get government involved in this. Uh, so we have these costs, uh, opportunity costs. The more cedars you have, less alternative things you can do. The health concerns, truth in labeling. I too, like Sam, am allergic uh, to the cedar pollen. Uh, I try to keep it out of the way of my uh, uh, commentary about the issue. Uh, we're having serious loss of habitat, as you said. Uh, some people say it's a trade-off of habitats, but it's pretty clear that uh, there's significant problems there. Uh, the issue of spread, uh, as long as you've got cedar somewhere, that means you're going to have more cedar somewhere else. We've got the wildfire danger in Oklahoma, at least, and it is a danger uh, in in spite of some people's views uh, to some people, uh, how much it costs to manage it, and again, this question of compensation. So do you, do you pay people that, uh, that don't want the cedar, but you're paying them because you want to keep yours? Or do you pay people to get rid of the cedar? Or do you keep that out of the equation? Policy in Oklahoma. We have had these kinds of discussions, and I have to say I am late to the, to the party uh, focusing on cedar. I've, I've looked at farm bills and, and other kinds of policies most of my career. It's only been recent with this. But uh, there have been good people like Terry Bidwell and Sam and Dave uh, focusing on these problems for decades in Oklahoma. And I don't want to say they failed. But we have not yet been able to get the policymakers to say this is a problem. 
that we need to do something about. And so through 2010, we had very limited funding for research and extension, one of the reasons that holds back the good, the good work of these guys. Uh, 2002, there was a state study funded by the Department of Ag in Oklahoma, and it was uh, co-led by a former congressman and uh, big time uh, Ag Farm, uh, Farm Bureau and, and livestock guy, along with somebody who was proactive in trying to make the, the venture of uh, using cedar for a business. And they came up with some ideas that they thought we ought to do. And uh, then out of that, eventually, we passed another bill in 2010 that developed this registry board. And so it's composed of people for and again, cedars. And uh, about all they've been able to do up to this point is to develop a way to uh, link up people who want to do something with cedar, either to, to mow it down, uh, to uh, harvest it for some business purpose uh, with people who have markets to do those kinds of things. So there's uh, two, three, or four hundred people registered on this act so far. And uh, the uh, Forest Department now, uh, Natural uh, Resource Ecology Management Department that Keith Owens leads, uh, uh, have had people involved in this uh, part of the activity, some very good scientists involved in it. Uh, so 2011 then, uh, uh, there was some attempt to have a bill that uh, would say we would use this uh, cedar biomass to develop renewable energy. Uh, it passed through the legislature, the governor vetoed it. Uh, in 2012, we had a couple of bills uh, attempted. One was signed that said, uh, let's use state prisoners to help uh, take this stuff down uh, on public lands. And uh, that, that was signed into law. And then there was the uh, Resource Reclamation Act attempt where they were going to help uh, subsidize cedar removal, especially on abandoned lands, and in fact make it a requirement. And the uh, governor, excuse me, that failed in committee. And uh, uh, then in uh, just this past year, there was more attempts to get some more bills to reattempt the, the Woody Biomass Bill, and it failed and to certify the inmates who were doing this so they could have a, a certification when they got out of prison. And uh, that failed. And then they attempted to reintroduce the Resource Reclamation Act to help subsidize and, and fund uh, uh, removal of cedars. And uh, that didn't uh, get anywhere. So you can see not much is going on policy-wise in the state. Uh, other than what extension and research are attempting to do. Uh, so right now what we've got is this very limited uh, education and research program, uh, underfunded, uh, people just choosing on their own to do something about this. Eradication is just not going to happen under these conditions, and as you heard, it's, it's just going to continue to worsen. I'm going to show you a map in a minute that complicates this too. There's been some talk about having increased state assistance, but continuing to have voluntary control because woe is us if we tell private landowners what they can and can't do on their property. Uh, so uh, this would mean we would have more funding for education and research, and we'd have state aid out there to help people uh, do this. Uh, maybe we'd get some slow reduction models might uh, that we've looked at may suggest that, but uh, we'd still be probably fighting a losing battle. Uh, we could mandate control. We could say, okay, we're going to change over a hundred years of history in Oklahoma, and we are going to do more to tell people what they can and can't do on their property. And we could have more funding uh, for education and research and subsidy to get these off. We could have fines and penalties. And there's some hope there that maybe we would begin to turn the corner on this problem. Probably have to take some of what Drac told us into consideration if we were going to go down that road. There is uh, virtually no political support in the state for this option right now. Uh, and we could decide it's not worth tax dollars. We want to reduce taxes. We want to get government off our backs and out of our pockets. Uh, but we're going to fine you, we're going to penalize you if you don't do something about the problem. 
and maybe we would be able to have some major reduction there. Reality is that's not going to happen in our state anytime soon. And I would contend it's probably not going to happen at the federal level that soon. So we get maybe some benefits where owners continue to decide on their own. They continue to have their private property rights to do what they want. Uh, cost, wildfire risk is high. Uh, cost to owners is high if they want to do something and people like uh, me and Sam's allergies uh, get worse. If we go to the voluntary program, uh, we might have very limited benefits. Uh, the cost is going to increase to the taxpayer uh, on a marginal basis, and uh, we're still not sure that it's going to solve much of the problem. If we go to either of the mandatory options, it's just a question of whether we're going to put tax dollars to that or not. But uh, um, we are going to reduce the likelihood of having the value-added option for entrepreneurs who want to do it, and we're going to force them to eliminate, uh, eradicate those. I didn't realize that John would talk about this and then DRAC, and I just threw this in since uh, uh, Dave and I have done some work in the state earlier, but the focus of, that I want to show you on this map to reinforce what they said is uh, this shows uh, the number of farms by county in Oklahoma from 1992 to 2007. We'll be getting the data up to update this uh, to 2012 here soon, we hope. Uh, if it's out, I haven't seen it. Uh, but what I did was I drew a circle around Oklahoma City so this shows any place that's within an hour's driving distance to Oklahoma City. And then I did the same with Tulsa. So it's kind of crude. But then I looked at the number of counties in Oklahoma where we saw a large increase in the number of small farms, 100 acres or less. And virtually every county that had that kind of increase is within an hour's driving distance of Oklahoma City or Tulsa. So you see 400, 500, 600 farms in those areas where prior to 97 they were larger farms and fewer of them. So you talk about the improvements in technology and science showing you what the solution is to burn and burn more intensely and burn more often. And look how much more complicated it's getting with demographic changes occurring in a state like Oklahoma. And this is going to happen down here as Texas growth continues to move northward because they can't get the water they want from us yet. So some of them are going to be moving up in here and we're going to see the same thing happening down here. So here you have all this great expansion of cedar coming in, and you can call it uh, an invasion, an infestation, or you can say we're investing in entrepreneurs that can have aromatic oil, but that's going to be intensifying, and as you reduce the size of farms and increase the number of farmers, uh, these are folks who still work full-time in the city, or they're just now retiring. And they're coming out here because they like the trees. They like the idea that they might have a place to hunt. They might have some ponds or streams to fish. They like to be able to sit on the front porch and see this landscape that looks green. They don't want to see the open plains. Complicate it very quickly most of them don't have a history of knowing what extension is. They don't have a history of knowing what federal agencies do for landowners in rural areas. And to try to educate them just to know that you're there and you can help them with a variety of problems is a first major hurdle to overcome. Okay, you want me to be done? Okay, I've got some data here from an associate on uh, uh, doing a study that if you do uh, manage with prescribed burns 
and put cattle out for grazing that you can greatly expand your uh, opportunity for profit on that land. This was uh, Darrell Peel at Oklahoma State University and Engel and uh, Bidwell helped with this study. Uh, we can talk about it if you want. Uh, we still have to decide as a society for public policy's sake how we define success. I've heard one definition of success in here today for the most part. Not everybody agreed with that. Are you going to exempt residences in rural areas, in uh, subdivisions and urban areas on the fringe? Are you going to require licenses? Are you going to have insurance? Uh, what kind of time frame are you talking about? And uh, what do you do about private property rights? And we've got a whole host of research options here that we could talk about if you want uh, that would help us make better public policy if that's a to go on this. So I'll stop there and either take questions now or wait, I guess. <laughs>